Hello, my name is Scott Grizzard from the University of South Florida. This is Calculus 1, Lecture 4A, Per Unit Change at the Margin and the Derivative. So today is the big key lecture topic thing for the entire first half of the class, especially for Module 1. We've had all this buildup of buildup about how to compute limits, what continuity was, all of these things. And the whole point of doing that is to see is to be able to do what we're doing today. Look at per unit change and then take the derivative. And so what we're going to look is we're going to look at a slightly different intuition. So you did um, velocity in peer leading and you can think of velocity as the per unit change at the margin, the marginal change divided by the distance, you know, whatever unit you had, um, the marginal change of distance. So now what we want to look at is a slightly different um, example. We want to look at marginal cost, an economics example. So we're going to have forward-looking marginal cost, but this is going to be the cost of the next unit. Okay, and this is section 2.1 and 2.2 in the book, by the way. Um, and then we're going to go through, so, and we're going to stick with this marginal cost. We're going to do a whole bunch of examples, and we're going to spend most of the time sitting in Excel playing with marginal cost. Okay, then what we're going to do is we're going to do a few more examples, and then we're going to start seeing how the derivative can fail, or something can fail to be differential. And our canonical example will be the absolute value, but there will be others. So when we look at our marginal cost curves, we're going to see some things that can fail. But there are five, and then we'll do some notations and things like that, and higher derivatives that are important, but not the main part of the story. There's five huge ideas being conveyed here. Um, and in the peer leading packet last week, last Friday, and in the packets this week, there are five huge ideas. So what I am interested in is per unit change at the margin. Let me tell you what I mean by that. So again, if we had velocity, I would be interested in how far I went over some unit of time, like miles per hour. Okay. But if I want to do an economics example, let's suppose that I have a microbrewery, Acme Microbrewery and Brew Supply Store. And I'm making a variety of beverages, mead, special IPA, and some kombucha. Now, if I'm making special IPA, I'm ordering specialty items, right? So I'm ordering some special hops, some special grains. It's our special IPA. So what I need to do is if, I, if, I, if I'm buying in small amounts, I'm going to pay a lot more per amount than I am if I'm buying in major bulk, right? If I, if I, if I sign a contract with the farmer that says I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to need this much per uh, week of his special hops and his special grains, uh, he's going to, um, do, you know, I can arrange special shipping. We don't have to, sh not everything's retail, right? We can do some wholesale business. So things are going to get cheaper as I buy more. That's the idea. So here you can look at what's my cost. If I've got zero, if I'm making zero, what's the cost per gallon of producing my first 10 gallons, okay? So that's what we mean here by this unit of margin. 10 gallons is the margin that I'm asking the question about, okay? And I'm asking going forward, if I am currently making no gallons, it's gonna cost me 450, I've got to rent per week, the space that's climate controlled and all that stuff. And it's going to, um, and then if I want to manufacture 10 gallons, it's going to cost me five simoleons and 87 centoleons or whatever per gallon, okay? So it's 587 per gallon for my first 10 gallons. That's my estimate. And again, I'm, I'm measuring over 10. So what I've got here for this cell here, it's going to be, the cost of producing, right? The marginal cost at 20 of producing another 10 gallons is going to be 
the cost of producing 30 gallons minus the cost of producing 20 gallons divided by 10, because I want a per gallon price. Okay. Now, I don't have to look back. I don't have to look forward. Okay. Mathematicians like to look forward, but I could look back. Economists like to look back. So in order to look back, what I'm going to do is look at the cost, the marginal cost of 20, say, if I was looking back, would be the cost of producing 20 minus the cost of producing 10 over 10, the, the number of things. And as you can see, what we expect here, the forward-looking cost and the backward-looking cost are, you know, sell for sell. If I go down one and over one, there it is. Okay, so I can either look forward or back. It doesn't really matter. Mathematicians like to look forward. Economists like to look back. Now, my total cost is given by this function here. 75 times the square root of 36 plus X. But I, I you know, I, I make decisions whether or not to make another batch based on the cost of the margin of me making another batch versus the amount of money I could sell it for, right? If I make a whole lot of this stuff, right? There's not really a huge market for my special IPA. There's like, you know, uh, 30 people in South Tampa, v uh, somewhere between South Tampa and Seminole Heights that are like, yeah, this stuff is great. And then there's a couple more that are just kind of indifferent type, you know, that, that, that like IPAs, but, you know, are just like Imperial IPAs. And, and so they, they don't really care if I'm having my special one or they, they what a, a dogfish or whatever, what they, they don't really care. They, they, they just want one of those IPAs. So I've got people that really like mine, some other people. That's not really important. The point is that I have to lower my price if I'm going to attract people who are indifferent between different types of IPA. So when I make a decision on cost, on whether or not to produce something, it's going to be made at the margin. It's going to be, I'm going to look at what I can make, what, I, what the revenue is going to be from it, minus the cost. So that's this idea of, 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 of marginal cost. And I can also think about cost, uh, profit at the margin, revenue at the margin, and all of these things, right? If I sell more of a good and I'm, I'm a, I've got a, a, a distinguishable good, a special good, like my craft IPA, if I, if, I, if I produce more of it, in order to sell all of it, I'm going to have to charge a little bit less. So I have all of these decisions to make based on those things. But again, I'm going to make it at the margin. Now, this is a somewhat interesting, a more specific example. Let's say I've got mead, and this one's going to be more complicated. We're going to let the government get involved, which is going to make everything more complicated. And I'm interested in the cost of the margin. So the government has a weird regime here that if I produce 100 units, okay, if I produce less than 50 units, I pay a tax at a certain amount per unit. This isn't the tax, this is the total cost of production, but there's some tax that gets added on, up to 50 units. Once I reach 50 units, once I reach 50 gallons a week, I have to buy a new style of liquor license, a new class of liquor license in order to produce more. Now, the cost of that liquor license, I still have to pay this tax on everything that I'm selling, but it kind of gets rolled into the, the, uh, the tax sort of gets rolled into the liquor license. So I buy the liquor license and then for a while, I don't pay any extra tax as I kind of work off my liquor license. And then a new tax kicks in that's even higher once I've kind of exhausted my, the amount I paid for my liquor license. So I have to buy this special liquor license in order to make between 50, more than 50, but up to 100, I, I, I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm paying less per unit tax. But then once I go over a hundred, I have to pay a lot more tax per unit that I produce, right? So because of this, I'm gonna have a weird type of function. It's gonna look something like this for my total cost curve. And we'll get to these weird marginal cost curves in a minute, in a while, okay? But this is what my total cost curve is gonna look like, right? Up to 50. I'm going to be, I'm going to 
I'm going to, uh, it's going to cost me this much. And then I have a jump when I have to pay for that liquor license, but then it kind of flattens out because I'm kind of, I've got that special tax rate as I kind of work off the thing on my liquor license. And then I have to pay more tax after that. So it kind of kinks back up a little bit. Okay. Now that's going to give me some, you know, perverse incentives in, in one sense, right? Because this thing keeps moving around. It's going to encourage me. See, in order to go from 40 to 50, there's a huge jump in cost because I have to pay for that liquor license. So at the margin, I may choose, not, you know, I may stop and stay under 50 gallons a week of mead production and just sell to a few people so I don't have to pay for this huge liquor license, which has this huge cost. If I'm only producing 30, if I'm only producing 40, I, I don't want to pay for this huge liquor license if I'm only going to produce 50 or 60. I want to pay for this, this huge liquor license if I'm going to produce a lot more. Okay. So that's the idea. I'm making decisions based at the margin. Okay. That's the first thing. The marginal cost or, or whatever the change of the margin is, is the thing I'm interested in. Okay. The second thing, if my function is aligned, then the per unit change at the margin is the slope of the line. Okay, so let's look at this. In my microbrewery, I'm making mead, I'm making special IPA, but I'm also making kombucha. Now, kombucha is very simple to make. You take a jar, a cheesecloth, you pour a little, you pour some black tea, you pour some, you put some sugar in there, and you put some distilled water and then you toss in your scooby your 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 bacterial thing that ferments the kombucha okay now kombucha will just once you put the scooby in it just makes itself you you take black tea distilled water and sugar and let it sit for two weeks in this thing you take your you know you take your scooby out every uh you take your scooby out after a week you know test strips you don't have to use a test strip i suppose to get your ph but it is sugar tea and distilled water okay just hanging out and sugar and tea and distilled water are not specialty items the margin that people are making uh, uh, the margin the the difference between wholesale and retail, there is some difference. And of course, everyone wants to tell their specialty tea. But if you're buying generic black tea, it's not really, really, really that much cheaper to buy in bulk. If you go to a restaurant supply store, you can buy black tea that you know will last you for four weeks, and you're going to be paying a pretty good wholesale price for it. Okay, so that's the idea here. I've got it. it, 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 it same thing with sugar. I go to a restaurant supply store. I buy a month's worth of sugar for making kombucha and I'm paying about what everybody else is paying for sugar. Um, it doesn't really matter how much I buy. That's the idea. And of course, at the extremes, that makes that's kind of silly. But you know what I'm what I'm considering between zero and 200 unit, 200 gallons a week production. Uh, there's really no change in the price of the ingredients. I need the same amount of tea, water and sugar. to to make the to make the 40th unit as i do to make the 60th unit as i do to make the first unit okay um and it always cost me the same amount of money so that's the idea here between this 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 idea that i've got my total cost curve is just a line okay it cost me 15 dollars to make kombucha per gallon period end of story right so that's the idea here the the so let me give you an example suppose i want to compute the cost at the margin of producing going from 20 to 30 uh, gallons of kombucha okay so what i'm going to do is i'm going to compute two things i'm going to have the uh let's see we're going to let h the margin of kombucha All right, we're going to let H be 10. So, uh, example. Let margin H equal 10. And we're going to go from 20 to 30. Okay. So, the marginal cost of producing the next 10 gallons per gallon 
is going to be the following. So I'm going to have MC H is 10 from the right because I'm going up of 20 is going to equal the total cost of producing uh, 20 plus 10, X plus 10, X plus H, minus the total cost of producing 20 all over 10, because 10 is my mar unit of margin. So now what I'm going to get is when I do this little bit of math, I'm going to get, I'm going to sub in my formula. So this is 15 X plus H plus 250 minus 15 times X plus 250 all over H. And in this case, it's going to be 20 plus 10, 20, 10, okay? So there's my formula for figuring out the marginal cost when H equals 10 and X equals 20. Okay, so now that I've got that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the math. So I'm going to get 15 times 20 plus 15 times 10 plus 250 minus, don't forget to distribute the negative, 15, I almost wanted to write 16, 15 times 20 minus 250. Don't forget to distribute the negative all over 10. Okay, so now stuff is going to cancel. That 15 times 20 cancels with that 15 times 20. That 250 cancels with that 250. And I am left with 15 times 10 all over 10. Well, those two are going to, those two tens are going to cancel. And I'm just left with 15. So it's going to cost me if I, if I, if I'm at, if I'm currently producing 20 and I want to estimate what it would cost per gallon for the next 10 gallons, I'm going to get 15. Okay. And indeed, I'm always going to get 15. So let's look at why. MCH plus of X equals the total cost of X plus H minus the total cost of X all over H. So my margin is H. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to plug in. So I'm going to get 15 times X plus H plus 250. That's TC of X plus H. So it's the total cost of X plus H minus 15X plus 250 all over H. And then look at what happens. Well, the same thing that happened before. I'm going to get 15X plus 15H plus 250 minus 15X minus 250 because I distributed my negative all over H. The 15x's cancel, the 250's cancel. So note that I, I had this complicated formula, but it's a line, okay? So when I did this whole thing, I wound up with the slope of the line. This line's slope is 15, and it's always 15, right? So this does not, note first, does not depend on H. And since this is a line, it does not even depend on X, okay? The slope here, is 15. 
okay? So it costs me, and that tells me it's going to cost me 15 simoleons per gallon forever. So, again, if I have a line, if my function is a line, then the per unit change of the margin is simply the slope of my line. Okay, my next big idea is that if I zoom in close enough, every smooth function starts to look like a line. Okay, so remember we had this idea of getting arbitrarily close. Some neighborhood, you get to decide type thing. Let's look at what happens when I zoom in on the, the chart for the special IPA. Okay. So here's the, remember this was the special IPA. I had the simple formula, 76 times 36 plus X. Okay. And that gave me the total cost. So when I go over here to the Desmos, here's the graph, right? I'm, I'm, I'm bordering from zero to 200. I said I was just going to stop at 200. And this is the formula. So I zoom in here, right? And, and this is not a line. This is clearly not a line, right? Here, I've got one thing going on. Here, I've got another thing going on. My margin is changing. Okay, not a line. However, what happens if I zoom in on this? Right here, you know, it's clear that the rise of a run from here to here is greater than the rise of a run from here to here, or from here to here, or from here to here. But what happens is I zoom in. Let's get really, really close to 100. Okay, so let's zoom in closer and closer and closer to 100. Around x equals 100. Now, look at what's going on here. If I zoom in far enough, around 100, this starts to look like a line. Let, let's zoom out again. Let's go over to 20. Let's zoom in around 20. Here's 20. Okay, there's 20. Now, this is not a line. You can tell as I go in here that this right here has curvature to it. Right? It curves. If I zoom in, and I zoom in more, and I zoom in more, and I zoom in more, and I keep zooming in around 20, look what happens as I zoom in. This right here would be basically indistinguishable from a line. As a matter of fact, I can actually label what that line would be. Look at this. I've got a line passing right through it of right here. That's basically a line. I zoom in and look at that. Here, if I zoom out again, I didn't need to zoom in this much, did I? If I zoom out again, I can see that this curve passes under the line. This, this right here is a line. That is not a line. But if I zoom in, I can't tell the difference. One of them's on top of the other. So that's the second big idea. If I zoom in close enough, everything's aligned. All right, smooth functions are aligned. Now let's look at something that's not smooth to compare it to. So again, I had this idea of Mead having a different formula. Mead was more complicated because of this weird tax situation that was going on with Mead. And it won't let me just move around easily, will it? Mead had this weird tax uh, situation going on, which meant that the formula was much more complicated. It, it, it's I worked out what the formula would be so I could do it easy math, but it's got a lot of if statements, right? But so let's look at the formula for the Mead. Okay. Here's the graph of Mead. Okay, this was the total, this was the curve. It's, it's, if I'm less than 50, it's something. But notice, as soon as I make 50 gallons of a week, my, 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 my costs jump because I now have to pay for this tax. 
okay? And then here, I've got a discount on the tax rate, and then all of a sudden, I'm paying the tax even more, right? My tax rate goes up again, okay? So here, I don't have a line, right? No matter how much I zoom into this function, this thing right here never looks like a line. It's not smooth. Neither does this. I've got this kind of kink in the graph here, right? Where, where it's not smooth. No matter how much I zoom in, this right here is never looking like a line, okay? So smooth functions look like lines if I zoom in far enough. That's our second big thing. If I've got a smooth function and I zoom in far enough, it's going to be indistinguishable from a line. I can't tell. How far is far enough? You decide. Right, whatever your application is, I can get within an epsilon of whatever you tell me. Right, it's a line within an epsilon. Within your error of measurement, it's a line. So that's the second big idea. I zoom in far enough. If I zoom in far enough, if I zoom in close enough, every smooth function starts to look for the, the line. Fourth major thing, okay? If I let the margin go to zero, okay, a complicated formula will become simple and lose its dependence upon the choice of how big the margin was. Not the unit, but the choice of the margin. So let me show you what I mean. Here, it already existed, right? Here, I had a line and it didn't matter. I already knew that it was independent of H, right? It's independent of H. Indeed, it's independent of X, right? This is a line. But when I went to special IPA a week, I don't have a line, okay? So it's going to, and look at these, look at these differences here, right? Here, my margin, if my margin is 10 gallons, right? My per unit cost, at, let's pick a number, let's pick 50. If I'm measuring at 10 gallons, my marginal cost is $3, is three simoleons and 93 centoleons. Now, again, let's do the same thing at 50. Here, my, my estimate is three simoleons and 99 centoleons. I don't know what a centoleon is. That's at 50. So here I'm at 393. Here I'm at 399. So, Let's look at what happens here if I go farther. So this was at 50. So if I go down here and I estimate per gallon, I'm using per gallon as my estimator, it's four simoleon and three centoleon. I can also measure by half a gallon and then normalize a gallon. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide my H is going to be one half. Okay. So I need to multiply by two, which is the same thing as dividing by one half to normalize to one unit of measure. So now when I do it, I'm going to get a different number. I'm going to get five. Oh, we want 40. I'm sorry. So we're going to have 429 per gallon is going to be my estimate. Now, look at the difference between the backward looking and the forward looking. Do you see how much finer it's getting? Okay. It's getting, these two things are getting closer and closer together. And remember the per gallon units. Okay. So here, what would happen if I could take it even smaller? Here it was at 0.5, right here. Contrast that with the 1 and contrast that with the 10. Here they're pretty far apart. When my margin is, 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 when my margin is 10, here are my estimators backwards and forwards. When my margin is 5, here are my estimators margin, uh, backward and forward. 
when my margin is one, here are my estimators backward and forward. So they're getting closer and closer together. Okay, that's interesting. What would happen if I took the limit as h went to zero? All right, I've got this huge complicated formula. If I want to compute the, the, the marginal change, estimate my marginal change, this, this formula is complicated. Right, I want the 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 seventy five times the square root of thirty six plus x plus, times plus x plus h, all under the square root minus seventy five times thirty six plus x, all over h. That's ugh. but watch what happens if I take this limit equal to take this limit to zero. Something very cool happens. Oops, I wanted that to be an exclamation point. Okay, so let's take the margin to zero. So let's have the limit. I'm going to do the right side. As h goes to zero from the right of the marginal cost, I'm sorry, of the, the yeah, the marginal cost of h plus. The right hand looking at h plus of x. Okay. So that is going to equal the limit as h goes to zero of the total cost of x plus h minus the total cost of x all over h. Okay. So let's put that in here. So that is going to be the limit as h goes to zero of 75 square root of 36 plus x plus h minus 75 times the quantity 36 plus x all over h. Okay. Now, I can't take h to zero yet because notice what happens if I do. This thing would become zero. This, I'm sorry, this thing would become that thing. So the whole top would go to zero. The bottom would go to zero. I have unhappiness. And there should be a plus there. Okay. So instead of that, let's take the, let's do a little math here. The first thing I could pull out is that 75. It's unpleasant. That could come across the limit and just hang out in front. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Okay. And what I'm going to have left is the limit as h goes to 0 plus square root of 36 plus x plus h. The parentheses are redundant. Minus 75, in this case, I, don't, I already factored out the 75, minus the square root of 36 plus x all over h. And now what I'm going to do, I pulled out the constant multiple, and now I'm going to multiply by the complex conjugate. I got two complex numbers, not the complex conjugate, the radical conjugate. I got two radicals, and I don't want radicals in my thing. I, I'm not making kombucha, so we're not hanging out with Bernie Sanders. We want to get rid of the radicals. Okay, we're making IPA, right? A nice centrist, you know, the nice centrist drink for conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans, if any still exist. So we want to have 36 plus X plus H plus the square root of 36 plus X all over this thing again. So I multiply by the, by the radical conjugate. I've got a minus here, so I did a plus. And let's see what happens here. So I've still got my 75 hanging out. The CML, by the way, refers to the fact that I pulled it out, not that I multiplied by the complex conjugate. Not complex, radical conjugate. I keep wanting to say complex conjugate, the radical conjugate. Okay, so now I've got the limit as h goes to 0 plus 
I'm going to multiply these two things together. I'm going to leave the bottom, right? Because at the top is the thing I'm trying to get rid of the radicals in. So I'm going to leave the bottom like it is. I'm going to leave it with an H and these two things unmultiplied. So what I'm going to have is I'm going to have an H on the bottom with all of this baggage. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the top here. Well, that's going to get rid of all of those radicals. So it's going to be 36 plus X plus H minus plus, right? So I'm going to wind up with a minus. The two terms in the middle cancel. That term and that term, when added together, are going to cancel. I'm going to wind up with minus the quantity 36 plus X. And if you need to work it out, go ahead and do it, that, that multiplication. There's nothing wrong with having to work that out. Okay, so now what I'm going to get is 75, the limit. Now, I could just distribute this now, but I'm actually going to write out the step of distributing the negative. Okay, so now I have that all worked out. Now I'm going to cancel the stuff on the top. So the 36s are going to cancel and go to zero. And the X's are going to cancel to go to zero. I'm going to have an H. And look at that. Because I didn't multiply it out, I've still got my H sitting on the bottom, all nice and happy. Now, I am not going to do two types of cancellation in the same step. That's a big warning. Just don't do it, right? I'm actually going to write that here with a big red pencil, with red here. Do not do, it's kind of, it's not really powerful enough. Let's try that again. That's just a big kind of warning here. Okay, don't do that. That's bad. All right, back to our story. Right, I either add cancel or I divide cancel. So don't do, you know, add and divide cancel in the same step because you can make algebra mistakes very easily that way. Okay, so now I've done this. I'm going to have 75 times the limit as H goes to zero from the right of H over h times this whole bit and that looks fun but the h's go away and i've got a one now on the top now now if i take the h to zero it's not going to, I'm not going to have a zero over zero situation. I take the H over to zero. That becomes a zero. This becomes a two whatever's in the, in the radical on the bottom. Okay. And my 75 is just hanging out. So let's do that. I'm going to take 75. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to directly substitute in the limit. And I'm going to get this one over. the square root of 36 plus X plus zero plus 36 plus zero. Again, it, 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 you can put zero right over there, but it's not necessary, right? I'm not looking, this thing is not one over some sort of zero. It's just, you know, one over, oops, that shouldn't be a zero. That should be an X. It's not one over some type of zero. I'm just subbing in a zero, but I'm going to get a whole number. So I don't need to worry about the, the plus or the minus. So that is going to be 75 over 2, 
right? This is 36 plus X. And that's it. So this right here is my marginal cost. With no H, as I go from the right, of X. So note, first of all, look at what happened. This thing was incredibly complicated. Right, it's got multi. It's got an H. It's got two places to stick X in. It's got uh, two radicals. I have to do. It's got. It's all sorts of complicated. Look at this formula. Seventy-five over two times the radical thirty-six plus X. It's not the happiest uh, hunky-dory formula going around, but it's still much nicer. Right. This I can actually play with, okay? It, this is a much nicer formula, right? It's not, ugh, and it doesn't depend on H. So I get a nicer formula, not depending on H. It still depends on X, okay? But it no longer depends on H, and it's simple. This right here is the miracle of the derivative, okay? I have taken this complicated formula and it becomes something simple, right? And it becomes something I can use. Now, let's look at this little formula in a little more depth. Oops. So here you shouldn't put you shouldn't put by the way derivatives. This is the derivative. I gave it away. You shouldn't put derivatives by the way on the same graph um, because the, I know the book does it. It's 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 wrong. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a different graph. And I'm going to put my my derivative of this thing on there. And I think I want my derivatives to be blue. Okay, so now I have this idea, the, the kind of instantaneous or the best estimate of the margin, or I let the margin go to zero. This instantaneous change or this marginal change period, the change at the margin is now a pretty formula, not depending on H. And it's, you know, that's a formula I could work with. I can do numbers with it. So let's see if I want to make this prettier. Okay, so all I did was restrict the thing's domain so that it no longer went outside my 200. All right, so now let's see what I've got, right? I, if if I'm at 40, my best estimate for the cost, it, you know, my best estimate for the cost at the margin of going to a, a, a of producing another um, gallon of, of IPA is... Uh, for, did I mess something up when I did I translate this wrong? 75 over 2 times 30. Nope, I didn't. Uh, so that is my best guess at the margin of the cost of producing, if I'm already producing 40, the next unit of IPA. And we look at this again. on our uh, spreadsheet. And that's actually a, a, a very good estimate. That's where these estimates are going. So again, if I'm at 40, my estimate based on my function is 4.29 or 4.3. And there's 4.29 and 4.32. So on one side, I've got something coming down, you know, that, that best guess is between those two numbers. And that's just 
beautiful. And I didn't have to do a complicated formula. Once I simplified the formula by taking the limit, I had a formula that, you know, computed faster and was just nicer. So that's the idea. That's the miracle of the derivative. I take the, the, this complicated formula, right? I take it to instantaneous or best guess of margin or let the margin go to zero. And I come up with something simpler. I went from complex to simpler by doing something, you know, difficult by taking this limit. That's just, to me, that's beautiful. Okay. The next thing I want to get at is that the derivative of x equals a, this miracle of the derivative, this instantaneous margin, right? So, if I take the margin to zero, I get something. Okay, and that's the miracle of the derivative. Now, the next big thing, point number five, the derivative at x equals a is the slope of the line tangent to the graph at a f of a. In other words, remember when we zoomed in until the line that was right near it was just on top of our function? Okay, that's what we mean by the derivative is the slope of the line tangent. Okay, so let's look at it again from the same graph. So here, here's our graph again, our special IPA. Now, if I come here to this point that I was playing with earlier, 20, 20 with the y value, 561. That's my total cost here. Now, I want to know what this change at the margin is. And what it is, is again, if I make a line, it is the slope of this line, the line tangent to the graph, okay? At 20, at A equals 20, this right here is the line tangent to the graph. The slope, the derivative is the slope of this line, okay? Again, this is the line that I would have super locally. Okay, so super locally, my function, my smooth function, my smooth cost function is, for all intents and purposes, this line, right? That was the first point. And now the slope of this line is what we call the derivative. So if I input 20 into my original cost function, I get 561.24 simoleons or 25 simoleons. But if I go to my marginal curve and I do 20, right? I get a number 5.011. Okay. That 5.011 is the slope of that line. Okay. Let me say that again. The output of the derivative, right? The, the derivative of A, MC of A, is the slope of that line of the line tangent to the total cost curve, okay? And that's the big, it's the local slope at this curve. And we're gonna play with that again in the problem set this week, okay? That's the very big thing. Okay, so we've talked about our five big things. They are again, okay, let's just say what this is again. We're interested in pre-unit change at the margin. If our function is a line, then the per unit change at the margin is the slope of the line. If I zoom in close enough, everything looks like a line. If I let the margin go to zero, a complicated will be, formula will become simple. That's the miracle of the derivative. And then the derivative at x equals a is the slope of the line tangent to the thing. So again, one more time looking at that. Let's say here I've got a tangent line generator for this graph, okay? So here I am at 20, but let's look at what happens if I move away from 20. So now you can see the slope of this line changes as I move away from 20. The green line here, the, the, the purple is my point. And as I move here, the slope of the line changes. The slope of the line tangent of the graph at that point changes as I move the point, right? 
So when A is 155, that's the line. That is my estimator, my linear estimator for this function. That's the line that it's close enough for all government work. Okay. Then as I move this way here, right, the, the slope of this line is going to get smaller. So right now the slope is really steep. And as I go to the right, right, right now the slope is getting steep, but the slopes are decreasing. Here, here the slopes are decreasing. Now, if I look at the graph of the thing, notice that the value of, of the graph the value of the derivative, the value of the marginal cost is decreasing, okay? And that's key here. This tells me the slope, right? 3.482 is the slope of the line tangent to this graph at 80. Okay. Now let's talk about, um, let's talk about just some more examples of the computations. Okay, so let's write out the formula. So let's do a big definition. Definition. Let f be a function defined on the interval d. Yeah. If, and let A and D. Right, A is some X, X value in D. F, the derivative from the right of X. It's written F prime of X equals the limit as h goes to zero from the right of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. f prime from the left of x equals the limit as h goes to zero from the left of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. If both exist and I didn't do what A was, so who cares about that? If both exist and the derivative from the left, I'm sorry, the derivative from the right equals the derivative of the, from the left, then f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h and f is differentiable at x okay now what's important from this definition is the following so when it asks you to state the definition of the derivative, that's what it's looking for, right there. Okay, that's the big thing it's looking for. f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. But just like limits, there exist derivatives from the left and the derivatives from the right. And those are actually kind of interesting because things can fail to be differentiable. Okay, I should say if both exist and are finite, that's actually key too. And this is uh, then we then the derivative f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And this is what you want. When it says state the derivative, you don't want all this preamble. This is all you want. Right there, when it wants the definition of the derivative. Wait a minute, there was this other definition. Well, we'll get to it in a minute. 
Okay, there are actually several definitions of the derivative, but one in particular we, we can have. So, okay, that's the definition of the derivative. All right, now, the question is, uh, let's do a couple more examples, okay? Let's just do an example. I promised you examples. So let's do 1 over x and the square root of x. So let's do example. Okay, so let's compute some of these beasts. Uh, it says let f of x equal the square root of x. Let's use the definition of the derivative to find f prime of x. So you cannot use the power rule if you know it already or any of those other things. Um, you must use the definition of the derivative if it says you use the definition of the derivative. So let's see how to do that. So what, are, what am I going to do here? Let's change this whole color to blue uh, a little bit. And then let's, uh, so what is it we want to show? We don't really know what we want, but our strategy is going to be use the H definition of the derivative. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the H definition of the derivative and some limit loss. So let's look at that. All right. So I've got F prime of X equals the limit. As h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. f of x here happens to be the square root of x. So that equals the limit as h goes to 0 of the square root of x plus h minus the square root of x all over h. Okay, so what I've got to do here is I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. And so I'm going to multiply by the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x all over the square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. And what I wind up with here is the limit as h goes to 0 of x plus h those two terms, minus that term, plus that term, they cancel, minus x, all over h times the quantity x plus h under the root plus square root of x. So the, th the x's on the top will cancel. Goodbye, goodbye. And what I'm left with is the limit as h goes to 0 of h over h x plus h plus the square root of x. Huh, I didn't really need any limit loss except direct substitution, did I? All right, so now the things at the top can't, the, the h's will cancel. The top one going to 1, well, both of them go to 1. And remember, only do one cancellation. Only do one type of cancellation per step. You need multiple addition cancellations in a step, all right? If multiple things will cancel on the top, that's fine. I did that earlier, but only do one per step. Only do one type per step, right? Don't mix a multiplication, an addition one, with a multiplication. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just directly substitute in the zero. And I get 1 over the square root of x plus 0 plus the square root of x. And that is the same as 1 over 2 root x. Okay. So. Now, here's a new piece of notation. d over dx. Not dy over dx. Just d over dx something means take the derivative of what follows. And I'm going to write it like this. d over dx, the derivative with respect to x. Notice that there's nothing else up here. There's no y, there's no a, there's no f. It's just d over dx. The derivative of the square root of x equals 1 over 2 root x. I didn't really need limit laws. What I needed was 
and direct substitution. Okay, use the H definition of the derivative, multiply by the conjugate. Okay, and then directly substitute on what remains. All right, and if I wanted to show, so if I wanted to do a want to show, that's what I'd do. All right, so that's the square root of x. Let's do another one. So this one right here says, using the definition of the derivative, find the derivative of 1 over x, the derivative with respect to x of 1 over x. Okay, so how am I going to do that? Well, the first thing is I want to find... f prime of x if f of x equals 1 over x. My strategy, use the h definition of the derivative. Okay, I keep saying h definition of the derivative. There are others. Um, one of them I'm going to show you shortly is equivalent to the other one. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to use the H definition of the derivative to find this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say F prime of X equals the limit as H goes to zero of F of X plus H minus F of X all over H, which equals the limit as H goes to zero of one over X plus H minus 1 over x all over h. That equals the limit as h goes to 0. I'm going to take a common denominator on the top, and it's going to be x over x times x plus h minus x plus h over x times x plus h. And then this whole thing is divided by h, which means it's multiplied by 1 over h. So I'm just going to do that right now. So what I did was I took that fraction with h on the bottom, and I just stuck it in front. It's 1 over h. right? Dividing by h is the same thing as multiplying. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. So I'm going to have x minus the quantity x minus h, x plus h over the common denominator x times x plus h times my 1 over h. So h just shows up, and I need my limit sign, or else I'm going to get points off. All right, now that I've done that, notice what's going to happen when I distribute this. This right here is going to be x minus x plus h, which becomes x minus x minus h, when I distribute the negative, over x times x plus h. I'm just going to leave that as it is, times h. Goodbye to the x's on the top. Limit as h goes to 0 of negative h. Now notice that there's an h in here. I'm just going to move it to the front. Okay, and those h's are going to go. And so now what I have is the limit as h goes to 0 of negative 1 over x times x plus h little direct substitution right in there, and I get negative 1 over x times x plus 0, which equals negative 1 over x squared. Thus, d over dx, 1 over x, equals negative 1 over x squared. Okay, so that's two examples of how to come up with derivatives using the definition of the derivative. 
Now, before we continue, let's just clean up this one little bit. That there's this alternate definition of the derivative that you saw in um, in peer leading, and it's the 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 t to x definition. So let's just stick it up there. Okay. Here's the t to x definition of the derivative. And the t to x definition is equivalent. Okay. And here's why. Okay. So here's the t to x definition. And you may use this. It works in a lot of situations. Like if we went back up to where we had the the square root of x, you would have had pretty simple math to use this. Same thing if you wanted to do 1 over x or x squared. All of those derivatives are easy to find using the t, using the x to t definition as well. Um, they're perfectly equivalent. And notice it doesn't matter which one comes first, x or t, as long as the one comes on top of the other. All right, so either one of these definitions is perfectly legal. Um, and again, if I wanted to use the the um, uh, use the t to x, so I could have used this one as well. They're absolutely equivalent definitions. Um, and here's how I do it. I would have. Uh, the derivative with respect to x of the square root of x equals the limit as t goes to x of f of x minus, or I already know what f of x is, so I'm going to do the square root of x minus the square root of t all over x minus t. And it's the exact same thing I did before, except the, there's a little bit less drama in the math. And here's what I'm going to get. So, I mean, I, I multiplied by the conjugate before. So what I'll do is I'll factor the bottom. So the square root of x minus the square root of t all over the square root of x minus the square root of t times the square root of x plus the square root of t. And I went over that in, in, in class in the quiz review. Uh, when you have the 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 x minus t, this is the square root of x squared minus the square root of t squared. So I could do a difference of squares on it. And that's kind of nice because it cancels out those. And I'm left with a little direct substitution action. I'm just going to stick the t in for x. And I wind up with 1 over the square root of x plus the square root of x, which is the same thing as 1 over 2 root x, which is the exact same thing we got before. Um, so either definition works for these. The problem is that when you do the cubes and things like that, you're going to want the X to H definition because you don't want to remember the difference of cubes formulas and all those formulas. It's much easier to just use the binomial theorem and punch those out. Or if you have to multiply them out, it's much easier to multiply them out than it is to factor them. Okay. So to, just to let you know, you, you, you can use it. You probably shouldn't. Um, you know, it is nicer for 1 over x. Uh, uh, to do that with the t to x definition is a little bit nicer um, because you've got fewer things to, to multiply out and stuff like that. But by and large, just stick to the uh, stick to the uh, h to 0 definition. But let me show you why they're equivalent. That's kind of important. All right, so my other definition is let f be a function. This is the h definition. This is the one I usually want, okay? Now what I want to do is I want to show that they're the same thing. Okay. All right. So when I want to show that they're the same thing, here's what I do. Okay. All right. There's the big definition that I want to keep. Now, what I want to show, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let, I'm going to do show. Okay. So. I want to show that the limit I want to show those two things are equivalent. So that double arrow means equivalence. Okay? These two definitions are equivalent. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here 
And I'm going to let t equal, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to let h equal t minus x, right? Because this is t minus x, here's h. So I'm just going to let those two be the same thing. You know, let h equal that. Now, if I do that, look what look what x plus h equals, right? So if I do that, then x plus h equals t. So what I have is the limit as t goes to x of f of t minus f of x all over t minus x. And notice also as t goes to x, h, which equals t minus x, goes to zero. Okay. So now what I've got equals the limit as h goes to zero of f. Now I had, I'm sorry, this is f of t, not f of x. All right, so now I have f of t. f of t right here is going to equal x plus h. And I've still got the minus f of x hanging around. And then on the bottom, I'm going to have a uh, h t minus x equals h. So all I've done is I've flipped these things signs and it just pops out. They're exactly equivalent. H here is the margin. H is just the margin of change. All right. So we did a few examples and we showed that the two are equivalent. Now, how can I break the derivative? let's take a moment to look at where derivatives can fail or where I don't have a derivative. So let's look again at this um, uh, mead production problem where I had the, well, this mead cost problem where I had a, a tax regime where I had to purchase a liquor license here. So I had a jump discontinuity, but then I got a discount on my taxes for a while until I get to this point where then my taxes went back up. Okay, so I have, here I have a jump, and here I have kind of like a kink in a hose. Okay, so the, the it, it's coming in, but then there's a sharp little, it's called a corner or kink. Now, they, these are going to be two problems area, and problem areas. So let's see why. Let's go back to our, 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 uh, spreadsheet here, and you'll notice that I've X'd out a bunch of this. So I've done the math in advance, so that we can just move through this quickly. But let's look at these problems. The first problem was that x equals 50. So look what happens here as I go from look what happens here as I go from 40 if I if I look up toward 50. There's this giant jump in my in my marginal cost. Um, and then again, I've been going there. But that's not the bad part. I mean, I can have jumps in my marginal cost. But look what happens as my cost gets, as my estimates get better. Look how the jump gets bigger. Okay? So here, I'm estimating, I'm basically kind of averaging it out over 10 units, this jump. Here, I'm averaging it out over 5 units. And of course, if I start averaging out over even fewer units, the jump is going to get bigger. So here's the jump when I'm only doing one unit of margin, right? It's 690. And then if I do a half a unit, or if I if I if my margin is a half gallon, from 49.5 to 50 gallons, the jump is 1,354 uh, simoleons. Okay, so this is a big, that's my marginal estimate cost. Um, so something very interesting is happening to the marginal cost here. And if, so let's look at this forward-looking marginal cost. So 
this this I'm sorry this backward looking marginal cost. So here we are right here. We're at 50. And let's look at what happens as we try to estimate a marginal cost looking back onto this segment of the line. So we're here at 50, actually on 50, and we're looking back at this segment of the line. So the marginal cost that we're going to want to look at is this one. And I can ditch, remember that I can, I can make H when I when I go to the 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 derivative. I'm making H, you know, infinitesimally small. I can make H small enough to get rid of a bunch of these marginal cost cases, right? If I've got three total cost cases, I'm going to wind up with six cases for each marginal cost because I have to talk about how how what happens when you cross these change points. Um, but if I can make the ch those changes arbitrarily small, I can actually get rid of all of the forward-looking ones, right? Because if I'm here, I can always make it small enough to be on the same line. If I'm here, I can always make it small enough to be on the same line. And note that this point right here, the, 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 the function is continuous at x equals 100. It changes the, the, the piecewise, but that's okay because the left piecewise equals the right piecewise at 100. So here my function is actually continuous. So I can fudge around anything. So I can choose to use, if I'm sitting here, I could choose to go up to here. And if I'm sitting here at 100, I could choose to use this equation if I'm, at, if I'm on this side. And I could choose to use this equation if I'm on this side. So if I'm at 100, I can, I can change which side I'm using. Um, which is going to get us in trouble later, but that's not really what we're concerned with here. Right now, we're concerned about this jump, and I can't do that. If I'm looking back from 50, there's only one equation to look back to, and it's the one that defines this piece of the segment. This segment, or segment of the function, or piece of the function. Okay, so let's look at what happens there. That's this special case, right? The marginal cost when I go to 50... is this equation here. And just as a quick note, um, right here, I'm using a negative. The, the, the function makes my h negative when it goes through. As you can see, I've got a negative h here instead of a plus h. That means that what I'm looking for is h to the right. So don't let that confuse you when you go through this. So when I go through this, I'm going to do a little computation. And the interesting thing is here on the top, I don't have a problem just simply subbing in uh, with an infinitesimal. I could just toss in the infinitesimal because this right here is not going to go to zero. In fact, it's going to go to a positive number here. I'm going to wind up with, when I'm done, I'm going to wind up with 2,900 minus 1,000 root 5, which is some positive number, right? Because 1,000 times 2.2 .2 is less than 2,900, significantly less. So I've got some positive number over zero plus this thing right here is going to infinity. And if you look on the graph, you can see that. Here's the graph. And if I, if I get this closer and closer here, the line is going to go straight through infinity. And there's just nothing I can do about it. So there, I'm going to say the derivative from the... Uh, I'm going to say that the derivative doesn't exist. It went infinite, and the derivative doesn't exist. Now, the derivative from the right actually does exist. Right, because if I'm standing on here, but I'm coming from this direction, that's fine. Okay, that's a finite number, but the derivative from the left won't exist, or it'll be an infinite. Okay, now let's talk about this. I said before it was continuous, so right here I can actually use two different equations to deal with this at, at 100. When I'm standing on 100, if I'm looking forward, I'm going to use the, the equation for this segment. If I'm standing back, if I'm looking back, I'm going to look at the equation for this segment. And that's going to get us into trouble right here. Because I'm going to use the different equations for, for the left and the right. This is the one I'll use for the left. This is the one I'll use for the right. Don't try and copy all this math down. It's just uh, all this stuff down. It's the big concept you need to get, you need to worry about. Don't worry about the forest. Don't worry about the trees. Worry about the forest. Okay, and I'll post this spreadsheet so that you can go through my numbers if you so desire. Um, and if you do, well, 
uh, uh, I would see a psychiatrist about masochism problems. Okay, anyway, it's kinky, right? You, you won't have a derivative on you because, you know, you've got masochism problems. Anyway, notice here that when I do this, the left and the right derivatives, the left and the right marginal costs are not equal. Three does not equal five over six this week. Those are not equal. And therefore, the derivative from the left does not equal the derivative from the right. All right, so there I don't have a derivative. So those are my two big cases here on this sheet. Okay, I've got this jump here, and I've got this kink here. Now, when I pull up the derivative, when I pull up the derivative function, here's what I'm going to do. My derivative here, and, and notice that I'm leaving the filled circles in on the endpoints. You can have them be filled. You can go, no, it doesn't exist because there is no derivative from the left here and there is no derivative from the right here. It's kind of like continuity, right? If you don't have it defined, you just kind of use the endpoint and you only say, oh, it's just the derivative from the left and the derivative from the right. So you can define the derivative on a closed interval. Of course, a lot of people who don't have better things to do with their time. They're logically equivalent. You just say which one you're going to do, and then you don't run into contradictions doing it, okay? So there's no need to worry about that. Um, if people with too much time on their hands go, no, you can't do that. Okay, fine. If, if you so desire for it to be like that. Okay, so here are the two points where the derivative is having, is having problems. So here I'm going to have open circles, and I'm just not going to have it defined. Now, jumps can be interesting because jumps, notice that in my, in my original function, both of these things, I mean, uh, one of these things was a jump. So if I had a jump here, I had a jump in my derivative. And here where I had a kink, I had a jump in the derivative. It turns out that only kinks require jumps. You can have a function with a, with a jump in the original function with nothing but a hole in the derivative. And that's a little weird, okay? I can have a hole in the derivative and be perfectly fine with, I could have a hole in it where I don't have a jump in here, but I had a jump in my original function. Um, so just heads up, you can do that. Uh, but here I've got two jumps caused by a jump and a kink. Okay, so those are places where the derivative fails and you can play with this if you want to. I'll leave the uh, links for the, if you want to play with the Desmos, I'll leave the links to the particular Desmos in the description below so that you can play with it. Um, but you can play, this is the left side mar uh, derivative. So you can see that it's defined, it's not defined here because it went infinite, but it is defined, I'm sorry, the right side. I think it's the right side. Yes, this would be the right side, no, looking left, the right side derivative. So forward derivative, there we go. Uh, the looking forward derivative, here it's defined, here it's defined. And then this, this is the other side's derivative um, where, ah, this is the one where I'm looking forward, I'm sorry. This is the forward looking one. I promise I'll get better. This is the rearward looking one. Um, and the, you can play with this if you want to and see where the one is defined and where the other isn't. Okay, so those are kind of the ideas of two types of things with the derivative can fail. If I have a jump and if I have a um, kink. So let's go back. Now, recall that continuity was an atheistic whiteboard. Nothing holy, nothing infinite in the middle, can't jump. The derivative is a prudish atheistic white boy. It doesn't like kink. It's also nothing holy, nothing infinite, can't jump, but it hates kink. So you'll never find, you know, the derivative, maybe not even really an occasional spanking. It's very meat and potatoes. Okay. There are other ways, so I, 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 derivatives fail, right? Here's like a jump discontinuity. 
and you don't have a derivative. Incidentally, you can have just a um, a discontinuity with a whole with a with a jump that only gives you a hole in the derivative. And I mentioned that before. So something like this, where I had x squared go here, and then I did x squared after something. It's still x squared, but it's now x squared plus 3 or something like that. It winds up with a hole in the derivative. So just heads up, those things can happen. Um, now, if the derivative goes to infinity in either side, that's that circumstance we had right here where I had a jump discontinuity, but I also can have infinity even without a jump discontinuity. So here I went to infinity from one side, but look at this one. Here I'm going to go to infinity from both sides. Okay, I'm going to go to positive infinity, and then this is going to be positive infinity. Here the derivative is just positive. Oops. Here my derivative is just positive infinity. I've got vertical lines coming from there and from there, and it's just it's it doesn't violate the vertical line test, but it has an infinite slope. So infinite slope is bad. And part of this is to be there are other definitions of the of the derivative that we want to be compatible with the one we have beyond just the x to t one that we already did. And that's why I have this rule. So if you're wondering, well, what's wrong with having a derivative of infinity? It's because I want to define this line as a function um, when I do different definitions. And when we play with the chain rule, we might see one of those, and then like an extra or something like that. Um, so just remember, infinite slope is bad. And this is the example of the kink. Now, we had a kink that wasn't very extreme. It was just a little kink, but it was enough of a kink. Here I've got, and they're all enough of a kink. If you have a kink, that's what a kink is. Here we've got the canonical example, the absolute value of x. On one side, it's negative. It's x if x is greater than or equal to 0. And again, I multiply the negative number by negative 1 to make it positive. So here I've got negative x. Here I've got negative x. Here I've got positive x. Here the derivative will be negative 1. Here the derivative will be positive 1. And it has a kink at 0. So as you can see, f prime left at negative 1 is, uh, at, at 0 is negative 1. f prime of 0 right is 1. And the derivative from the left is not equal to the derivative from the right. So again, derivative is an atheistic prudish white boy. All right. So that's it for places where it can fail. Let's look at some notations. There are different notations for the derivative, okay? And it's not, you know, this department uses, uh, you know, it's not that this field uses this particular notation for the derivative, and this one uses a different one. The integral is like that. The integral only has really two notations left, and the only people using the weird non-standard format are me and the people at the uh, pharmacokinetics that you're going to have to do if you go to medical school. OK, they're the only people that still use the other uh, notation for the integral. The derivative, however, has a ton of notations. Um, I've scratched the surface on them and it's not I'm going to I'm going to emphasize the big three. But it's important to note that every field uses these things interchangeably. Some fields may use this one 25 percent of the time, this one 60 percent of the time and this one, you know, uh, whatever's left, 15% of the time, um, except under this circumstance where we use this one 80% of the time and this one 20%. It's like you just have to know them, and there's nothing else to do about it. You have to know the different notations for the derivative. So here's what they are. Uh, so all of these, f is going to be a differentiable fun equation described by an equation y equals f of x, and a is just going to be some number in the x space. So if I want to talk about the derivative at a particular point, I write f prime of a. Or I can write dy over dx when x equals a. Right? This is a specific one. Or I can write y prime when x equals a. I hate this one. Or I can write d over dx when x equals a of f of x. Or I can write d over f of x, uh, d of f of x over dx when x equals a. Okay? Now, if I want to talk about the, the derivative as a function itself, right, the derivative of f as a function itself, I use prime notation here, f prime of x, 
or I use Leibniz notation dy over dx, or I use d over dx of f of x. Now, note, this right here, dy over dx, means df prime of x. That's going to be different than d over dx. d over dx means take the derivative of with respect to x. So this right here is a verb or command. Okay? And it's a common mistake to interchange them, and it's wrong. This right here is a noun. Okay? The derivative of y with respect. That's a noun. Okay? This is a command. Take the derivative of what follows. Okay? You can think of it as the verb form of the derivative thing, right? It's just d over dx. There's no y over here. It's take the derivative with respect to x of f of x. Now, I can also view f prime as a function and only as a set. And then you'll see f prime just by itself with no x. You'll see df over dx. And you'll see d over dx of f. Okay. So the big three that we're going to worry about here are these three right here where we do the output rule. I'll talk about the whole function as a setback, and I'll talk about d over dx a little bit later. But right now, I just want to focus that there are three notations we need to keep straight, and they're different. And if you mess them up, and enter, if you if you do dy over dx when you and then follow it with something, it's actually wrong because you've taken the the y value the the value in dy over dx space and multiplied it by something else instead of saying take the derivative of what follows. So be careful with these. F prime is, this is prime notation, this is Leibniz notation, this is operator notation. You also have dot notation and um, other weird notations that exist. Finally, we need to talk about taking higher derivatives. So I can take derivatives of derivatives. So this is what that means. F double prime of X equals the derivative with respect to X of F prime of X. So I just take the derivative again. So for my example, if F of X equals X squared, F prime of X equals 2X. F double prime of X, I take the derivative of this, I get 2. And then this weird 3 thing says take the third derivative. This is the third derivative of F. And in this case, it would equal 0. The other ways to show that are with these little exponents. So when I say d squared over dx squared, I don't actually mean something squared. I mean two derivatives of whatever follows. So take the derivative once and then take it again. Right? I can actually view this as this. Take the derivative after taking the derivative of f of x. And because these look like they're multiplied together, even though they're not, because they look like they're multiplied together, we write that d squared over dx squared. And that's just because we hate you. So you know. The notation is a language, and it's got some irregular verbs, and this is one of them. Okay, f, the three here, is to say to take the third derivatives. Note that this is different than f to the three. This is f to the three in parentheses means take the third derivative. That means take the derivative of the second derivative, or take three derivatives of the first of f, or take two derivatives of the derivative of f. And then again, this is the third derivative of y with respect to x, which is the third derivative of f of x, which is take the third derivative of f of x. Okay, so it was a long lecture this evening, uh, today. It's now this evening. I started it when it was bright and sunny out. Um, this is it for the material of test one. Everything above this point here, everything above is what's on test one. Everything that we're going to do for it. Now, the next time what we're going to do is prove the power. Rule. Technically, that's test two material, but it helps you with test one to understand how to do the proof. You can't use the power rule. But if you understand the proof, it's going to help you with a particular question on the test. Okay, so that's it for me this evening. 
Um, I didn't do the stuff about finding the tangent line because it was running way over. Um, but we're going to do that in the activity this week, so I'm not worried about it. Um, and you'll have plenty of practice on finding the equation of the tangent line in uh, uh, during the week. So I will see you all in class.